the screen. Yeah, we can see that. So um, we're keeping introduction short because we let our speakers introduce themselves. Uh, but uh, it's an honor and pleasure to uh, introduce Peko Hasoy and uh, Peko, take it away. Thanks, Orit. Um, OK, so um, I was going to start straight with the map, but um, Doug has forced me to up my game. So Doug, during your talk, I found a baby picture um, to share with everybody. <laughs> so uh, this is one of my, my favorite pictures from when I was growing up. Uh, and one of the reasons I love this is because clearly there was a professional photographer that took this photo and said, great job, everyone. We got it. That's a wrap. <laughs> so um, anyway, so this is one of my class pictures. I was a Montessori kid. Um, this is me right there. Um, and uh, I grew up in uh, Oregon. Um, I like this map of Oregon because it kind of tells you what, uh, what it's like to grow up in Oregon. Um, there are lots of mountains. Um, there are cows. There's bicycling. There's fossils. There's whales. Uh, there's fishing. Um, and I grew up right around here. I don't know if you can see my pointer um, near this little orange person with the baseball bat. Um, and uh, this is uh, Corvallis, Oregon. So this is where um, Oregon State University is. And um, so as I was putting this talk together, I was thinking about, all right, what, what were sort of the branch points in my life that, that led me to biophysics or to working in a biophysical space? Um, and certainly one of the first ones was my first uh, research lab job, which I had um, in high school. Um, so there was a lab next to the university that was run by USDA, US Department of Agriculture. And um, in Oregon, there's a, there's a lot of farming. And one of the common crops is uh, strawberries. So this is what a strawberry leaf looks like. I don't know if you guys have ever picked strawberries, um, but I, I took this, I used this one because um, you can see that the stems and the leaves are kind of hairy. And um, my boss had a theory that the hairs on the strawberry leaves um, were there to protect them from pests. So we had a summer project where we were gonna look at how much protection strawberry leaves um, get from these pests. So I had two jobs. This is my, my high school summer, I had two jobs. The first, was um, care and feeding of the weevils. Um, this was a terrible job. <laughs> it's, hard, it's hard to imagine a worse job um, until you hear what my second job was. The second part of my job was counting the hairs on the strawberry leaves because somebody has to count them. <laughs> so every day I would come and put the strawberry leaves under the microscope and I would count strawberry leaf hairs. And um, so you might think this was a fairly inauspicious way to start a research career, um, but it turns out my boss was fantastic. He was a, a wonderful man. And he understood that um, people cannot spend their lives all day counting strawberry leaf hairs. So he made sure that there were other things that we did. And so I learned things like how to run, uh, do gel electrophoresis, how to build an RNA library, all of these kinds of skills that are useful in, in a bio lab. And, um, one of the things I remember from this time is I told him that I, um, I wanted to major in physics when I went to college. And uh, the next day he brought in his cloth bound original copy of Halliday and Resnick, which he used as, uh, in college as a, as a freshman and, um, and gave them to me. And I used that book as, as a freshman and I've carried them around ever since. So, um, so this turned out to, uh, um, despite the fact that I was raising weevils and counting strawberry leaf hairs, this turned out to be a great introduction to biology. Um, so then uh, after that, um, this is sort of my, my trajectory. Um, and as Doug says, we jump around a lot. So down here, um, you can see there's a little symbol for physics, for math, and for engineering. So I, I jumped around there. Um, I did my undergrad um, Princeton in physics, graduate um, University of Chicago in physics. Then I went to Cron Institute in applied math. Um, my first faculty job was Harvey Mudd College, um, which is an undergraduate teaching institution um, in applied math. Um, and, then, uh, and then I moved to, to MIT in mechanical engineering. Um, and throughout that trajectory, there were many, many people, this, this goes back to, to Doug's uh, point about pay it forward, because there were many, many people that supported me in incredible ways along the way. Um, I didn't put any names on here, but you'll probably recognize many of them, some of whom have even given living history talks. <laughs> um, if, if not more than one, there are certainly people on here who could who could give a talk uh, in this in this series. Um, so, um, but since I have ten minutes to give this talk, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip forward to um, when I became a, a junior faculty at MIT. Um, and before I do that, I have to give you one piece of information to tell you what my state was when I got there, um, and that is that this whole period over here, um, my research was entirely fluid mechanics. So no biology. Um, it was entirely pretty much thin films and instabilities in thin films. So I did, I did a lot of sort of 
uh, like stability calculations. Um, and then I arrive at MIT, um, mechanical engineering. So um, arrive at mechanical engineering. And now uh, I'm gonna take the story to where it's like my first week on the job. So um, there's, there's nothing in my office. You know, when you start a new job, you, you get there, there's an empty, empty desk, empty shelves. There's nothing in the office. And um, so I, I got to MIT, I'm super excited. Uh, I'm sitting in my empty office and um, there's a knock on my door. And uh, I open the door and there's a student who says, Professor Hosoy, I've read all your papers. I'm really excited about your research. I really wanna work with you. And I thought, this is amazing. I've been here less than a week. There's already students knocking on my door who wanna work with me. This place is incredible. And I said, what do you wanna work on? And he said, I wanna build robots. And I was like, I have never, I don't know how to build a robot. <laughs> I've never built a robot in my life. And so I said, okay, well, I'm sorry. I've, I, I don't know how to build a robot. And I sent him away. Um, and the next day I'm sitting in my office and there's another knock on my door and it's another student. Professor Hosoy, I'm so excited. I've read all your papers, really wanna work with you. Oh, what do you wanna do? I wanna build robots. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> okay, I'm, I still don't know how to build a robot. So this happened four times, four times in my first week at MIT. And I thought, maybe there's another Hosoy at MIT who works on robotics and they're going to the wrong office. <laughs> and, uh, but eventually I figured out that, no, that's not the case. Um, what was happening is that the students in mechanical engineering at MIT all wanna build robots is what I learned. <laughs> so I figured, okay, um, if I'm gonna survive here, again, this is my first week, my first week as a junior faculty at MIT, figured if I'm gonna survive, I'm gonna to have to learn how to build a robot. So the next week I get another student who knocks on the door. Okay, this is, this is now um, probably the most influential person in setting my trajectory um, on a biophysical physical track. So this is Brian Chan. Uh, Brian was my first PhD student at MIT. Brian comes to the door um, and he says, I want to work with you. And I was like, I was like, great. And I'm thinking, please don't say I want to build robots. I said, what do you want to do? And he said, um, well, I've been working on this problem uh, about with water striders. I'm like, okay, great. No robots. That's fine. Turns out he had built a robotic water strider, but that, that's, a, that's an aside. Um, so, uh, so he'd been working on, uh, on a project as an undergrad with water striders. And the way you study water striders is you go to a pond with a bucket you scoop up all the water and you get a bunch of water striders and you look at the water striders. Um, but what Brian had noticed is that in addition to, to getting water striders, he also got snails in this bucket. So he'd been staring at snails for the past few weeks and had gotten interested in the way snails move. And if you think about it, snails actually move in a very strange way. Um, and so he said, yeah, I'd like to study how snails move. And the great thing about this is that the way snails move is that they secrete a thin film of fluid um, between the foot and the substrate. And the way they propel themselves is by generating stresses in this thin film. And as I told you on the previous slide, the only thing I knew how to do at this point was thin films of fluids. So I'm like, great, this is, Brian has come to me with the one problem that I actually know how to solve. Um, so, um, so I said, yes, yes, come in. I'm gonna take you, I'll take you on as a student. And um, I, you know, so I said, okay, uh, for starters, um, why, don't you, why don't you take a couple of weeks, go see what's been done in this area, come back and see what you found and we'll see if there's anything interesting in this problem of snail locomotion. So Brian says, great. He goes away and he comes back. And I said, uh, so what did you learn about snails? And he goes, oh, oh, I, I solved it. And I'm like, what do you mean you solved it? It's been two weeks, right? <laughs> and I'm like, okay, so what did you do? And he says, I built a robot, <laughs> I kid you not, in two weeks. So he built, it, he built the robot. So we now have a wall climbing robot. Now I've been, so let's see, that was my first week. So this is my third week at MIT. So I'm like, great, I have a robot. I'm all set, problem solved. But the great thing about this robot is, you know, this sent me on um, sort of a trajectory of understanding how to combine that interface of physics, math, um, biology, and design. Um, and so this robot that Brian built basically led to two decades of work in um, biolocomotion, in soft robotics, and uh, bio-inspired design. Um, so that's my, that's my 10 minute version of my trajectory. Um, and I'm gonna put up one more slide um, to give advice since we're supposed to give advice. 
So um, I was thinking about if I was going to give you one piece of advice, what would that piece of advice be? Um, and my uh, advice is uh, find your community. And I'm giving you this advice from the perspective of having been associate dean for the last four years. So I've seen a lot of promotion cases. I've seen every promotion case that's come through the School of Engineering in the last four years. And what I what I've learned is that the ones that are really, really successful and really um, uh, like just sail through are the ones where, where people have found who is their community. I mean, by the way, so this is the community that I showed you earlier, a community of people who A, understand what they do and B, appreciate the way they do science, right? And in a field like, like um, uh, biophysics, it's so broad, you, you really have to help people define where you sit, right? So, because there are people who are doing um, really complex simulations. There are people who are doing proofs. There are people who are um, making very um, uh, minute measurements. There are people who are doing mechanistic modeling. And if you ask the wrong person for letters, you, they're going to have no, they'll have no idea, right? So I think especially when you're in an interdisciplinary field, it's really important and also a little bit tricky to define who are your people. So my advice is, um, you know, it, as soon as you can start to figure out who is in your community. Um, and like I said, these are people who will, who will, um, you know, these will serve as people who will challenge you. They are people who will inspire you. Um, but they are also people who are going to support you and who are going to write letters as you go, as you go through your career. So um, find your people. That's my advice. And with that, I will um, stop and I am happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Pekka, for a wonderful talk. That was great. Um, I think we are running a bit late, but we probably have time for one or two um, questions, if anybody has any. Can I ask uh, a question? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so you moved from a four years college to MIT. How was that move? Like, uh, it seems like a very unlikely move. Uh, Yes, it, um, it was so. So I get. I can tell you the story. So first, I will tell you. I loved Harvey Mudd College. I, I had a great, and it was hard for me to make the decision whether whether or not to move. Um, and I'll I'll tell you the short the short story of how it happened. Um, uh, so so you'll see that there are there are a lot of trajectories in which I would have just stayed at Harvey Mudd. Um, but uh, so before I went to Harvey Mudd, I I had applied to a bunch of um, a bunch of places, maybe including MIT Mechanical Engineering. Um, and um, when I sent my application to MIT, I, I heard nothing, like not even a thank you for your application, like nothing, not zero. It went into a black hole, never heard nothing. And um, so then I, I accepted the job at Harvey Mudd um, uh, and my, uh, my husband, by the way, I met my husband, at, we're talking about trajectories at Chicago and I have Nancy who is on this call to thank for the matchmaking there. <laughs> Um, so my husband had a postdoc and, um, in New Jersey. So I said, okay, can I delay for a year? So we spent, uh, we spent a year in New York and then we drove across the country and then I started my job at Harvey Mudd. So at this point, it's like two years since I've sent in an application, right? It's eight, but that application is ancient history. So I show up at Harvey Mudd and again, I'm in an empty office. I'm one week into my job. I have a telephone on my desk. I don't even have a laptop because this was too early for laptops. There's a telephone on my desk and the phone rings. And I answer the phone and the phone is like, uh, the guy on the phone is like, um, hi, this is um, uh, Rohan Abiratne from um, MIT Mechanical Engineering. And as you might know, we have a search going on. And I thought, well, I knew two years ago that you had a search going on. I had no idea that you have a search going on now, um, but I thought, well, maybe he wants me to send in an updated CV or something. Um, and he goes on and he says, yes, and we'd like to make you an offer. And I was literally like, who, give me, who is this really? Give me a break, <laughs> John. Is that you? <laughs> like, and um, and it turns out that they had kept my application on file, um, and I had postdoctored at MIT, so they knew me. Um, and I, I said, "Well, I literally just started a job a week ago." <laughs> and he said, "Why don't you just come out to visit?" And so I went out to visit, and um, and like I said, it was a hard choice because Harvey Mudd was it was a really like the students were terrific. It was in Southern California. The weather was perfect every time. My husband was postdoc in Caltech, um, but but in the end, I decided I decided to go. And and it was. I mean, I, I would never change that decision. It's been absolutely incredible. But um, so 
So I, I would say the lesson there is it's not over till it's over. Your, your application may have gone somewhere. It doesn't mean they're done looking at it. All right. Thank you, Peko, so much uh, again for the discussion and the great talk. Let's thank Peko again, everybody. Clap.